Welcome to Feel Good Fathers. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Off air, I've been talking with Matt and Audra. Uh, we've been kind of uh, hearing their background and getting everything prepared. One thing that's really interesting to me is that uh, they have a uh, martial arts studio, uh, specifically in TKD, which is Taekwondo. I'm a former green belt. I haven't practiced in a while. Uh, it's been super fun. We might talk a little bit about that, but mainly I want to introduce that they have uh, Karim's Little Leaders, which is their program. It's for second generation character and leadership de development for young children ages three to nine. And we're going to get into what that means. Uh, Matt and Audra, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. We're so excited to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, let's jump right in. Uh, this is a topic that we talk a lot about on the show, a lot of guests, leading from the front, men leading the house. What, what's your perspective? I agree with you 100%. Um, it's so important that when you have a family unit, uh, hopefully, if mom and dad are working together uh, and they're having children, that the father be an instrumental part of leading from in front. And it's so important. A lot of the fathers that I meet with today sometimes say, number one, I didn't have a father, so I don't know what to do. Number two, I did have a father, but they didn't really lead me. So I didn't really learn very well <laughs> that, uh, that, that I want to emulate. I don't want to do what my dad did, right? I want a new, to my, in, my, in their mind, there's a new and a better way, right? Got it. Yep. And so I've seen some fathers that are kind of lost. They, they, they struggle with how do I do the right thing? They have phenomenal intentions, but they just don't know what to do, right? Um, and so I believe that the father is so important in the success of the household, just like the mother is. I think it's mm -hmm. so important that you work together as a team and work collectively, right? So in the beginning, talking about leading, um, if you look at, and I'm going to equate a family unit to a home, to a business for a second, if that's okay. So okay. if look at a corporation like General Electric, right? When Jack Welch was there, you could read about how well the company performed when he was their CEO. When that, when he retired, arguably the people that came after did it differently. And they ended up having to sell off some units, strategic business units and other change their direction and do other things because the CEO was no longer there that built the company and got them there. If you, okay. if you draw that same parallel to a family, what is important to the father? What do you want? <clears throat> is it a financial legacy? Is that most important to you? Is it that the children go to college? Is it that you just raise them to the age of 18? It's so important that the leader, the CEO, or the father of the household, set a vision, set a direction that everyone understands and can get behind and go forward with. And when you have that same common goal, then you do make major steps forward in development. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> when our, we have four children that are now older, our youngest is 25 and our oldest is 30 years old. Okay. So as a result of raising our own children, as well as having our martial arts school for 45 years, we've taught thousands of children. And some of our teaching also translated to the parents, right? It's been so important that we identify where we're going and where we're headed. And just a small minor point would be if our if if one of the kids came to me and said, you know, Dad, can I have um, a sandwich? I knew where I belonged, so to speak, and Audra took care of the kitchen. I didn't say yes, you can. What I said is, what did your mom say? Well, I didn't ask her. Okay, 
then go ask mom. Right. I, I okay. wanted my wife to know that I supported her in what she was doing to nourish the family, take care of the house. And I didn't want to get in her way and put my opinion in there because in my mind, she had her own direction and guidance and I needed to support her in doing what she was doing. Let's, I, I, I love the train of thought, but I think we need to get back to the general electric example. So Jack Welsh is the father of GE, of modern GE. The next generation comes yes. in, they don't accomplish something. What do we attribute in the analogy of what were his strengths and what were his weaknesses? And then we can translate that sure. to how you know, our opinion of fathers and leading the household. If you read um, reviews about Jack Welch's not only, uh, let's say, autobiography and his corporate legacy that you could see because they were a public company, he was highly scrutinized. Um, arguably, depending everyone's opinions, a little different, but arguably, what you can say Jack Welch did so well was he conveyed the message and the future journey to everyone. He didn't keep that message to himself. He got it across to everyone throughout the organization. I think last time I looked, currently, I think General Electric has 150,000 employees in the United States, right? So there's still a large entity, don't get me wrong, okay? But yeah. What Jack Welch did very, very well was he was able to share his vision. He was able to get everyone to buy into that same vision. And they worked to collect collectively to make that dream come true. And they didn't do that in the second generation. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I was curious. The because, second generation. So what did he do? What did he do poorly? Arguably, he did well. I, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, uh, the, the only thing that, that the, I believe it's so important to train your replacement. And arguably, he did that. The only thing, I, I don't really have anything negative that I saw that they did other than maybe uh, doing a better job with who replaced him. So the succession, so in this yes. analogy, the succession planning was the part that failed that wasn't as great. So how do we now, let's translate this to the household. So sure. I'm the father. I've built, we're a feel-good father. We've built this house. How do, what's this, the succession plan, the next generation? Because okay. also in so, the GE analogy was GE sure. was first to a certain yes. point. And now yes. they've had to, they've separated. They brought a brand new CEO in completely untrained, not of the Jack Welsh legacy whatsoever. Well, he's he turned was. It around, he broken was. apart the company. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the so, idea so is I that guess here would we be know, my analogy, if it's okay, yeah. is Let's step, let's, let's go back to our father's father. My dad. Grandpa. Okay. Okay. How did grandpa teach his son to be a father? Right? Oh, I'm not sure. How, how did how did your grandpa teach his son to be a father? Correct. Okay, that's the parallel. Okay, when it was very evident with our martial arts students, out of a hundred percent of the kids, let's say we would teach two hundred children monthly, generally. Okay. Sure. Okay. Twenty five percent of those children were being raised by grandma and grandpa. Another 25% were being raised by a single parent. And maybe the other 50% at least had mom and dad in the household together as support. Okay. So 50% of the children that we taught 
did not have their dad or mom missing. One was missing in the household. Okay. So how if so so let's go the parallel is here. You grandpa might have been great, but maybe he didn't exist in your life. Maybe he was non-existent. Where you how did you learn? Okay, if I say you want to be uh, an engineer. How do you become an engineer? You identify the skills, maybe math and different core subjects that are required. You work hard in those areas. You identify a university that can help you learn those tasks and skills. You attend for at least four years, maybe six, maybe eight to master those skills. Then you go to an employer and the employer says, yes, Thank you for bringing those skills on. But that's only the basics. When you come in our organization, we do it this way. We believe this. We believe that. So um, so to, to further a dream, and if you want to be an engineer, it's a simple plan, hard to orchestrate, difficult coursework, expensive, but it's attainable. What training academy is there for a father? There's not. What basic skill sets should you impart? Who knows, right? Oh, right now, there's fathers that I have talked to in our martial arts school that never had a father. Right. So how can we expect them to know what to do and how to do it? The Great most question. I believe. I believe a father's most important job in my life is raising my children. Secondly, is my career, right? But I, I believe raising happy, healthy, well-adjusted children with a foundational character and leadership skills so that they can be successful is my premier and my most important goal that I have. What are the uh, what are these character traits? What are what are, when we're talking about developing character? You said happy and healthy. Yeah. So what are the I character guess, traits you're talking about? Sure. So I guess more than traits themselves, okay, um, is the initial concept. Okay. So I think it's so important um, how you think first. Okay. So as an example, what I'd like to say is I want fathers to know that there's studies that show if you want to teach your child any character or leadership behaviors that uh, come be develop into habits, you want to do that before the age of nine. Okay. And that's not just me saying that. There's a Brown University study where they studied 50,000 families and tracked them for 20 years. And they say, basically, the success or uh, lack thereof habits are rooted in the children by the age of nine. We, we talk about um, better habits, better future. Mm, okay. And that's kind of a, a mantra, you know, and um, when you had asked about the character and leadership traits, I think really to be specific, because that sounds like what you're asking is um, it's focus, it's discipline, it's respect, integrity, teamwork, leadership, citizenship, um, basic table manners. Some of these things just are being missed. And so those are the leadership skills that we believe that the children need to be learning on a regular basis and, and families are busy and everybody doesn't think about that. And we talk about, yeah, is your father around to teach that? Is it the mother? Who's doing that? But how to help your home be successful? Does that answer how your do question? You translate, you ask? It, it does. Thanks, Audra. Uh, so how do we, let, let's take a couple of these at a time and just what are really great examples? Because the, here's what's true about most parents. Most parents don't understand the neuroscience of a child. 
most parents, especially Agreed. at the higher end of that age bracket, treat their kids as way older and way further developed than they currently are. The child doesn't even have abstract thought until they're into their teenage years. So there's an abstraction that can't exist. We're talking at most of that's going to be uh, mimetic. So uh, copying behaviors, copying sentences, being surrounded with punchy lines and quotes and uh, value-based family living. Uh, a lot of these things, you know, talk about focus for a kid today with everything going on. That's, that's a challenge in and of itself. So why don't right. we go through a handful of these elements and what's, what's one or two principles that we can impart to feel good fathers to develop these traits in our kids? Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I know I think more, okay, uh, because my goal is to develop a duplicatable system that works for many fathers, not just one, right? So as an example, when we were creating our program, there's a what's called learning pyramid. 1964, National Lit Training Laboratories created what's called a retention pyramid. They, they actually studied what can we do to increase the retention of our individuals? Good question, right? Because one of the things that really uh, frustrates parents sometimes is the kids don't remember, they don't retain, and they didn't learn it, okay? Then I go back and say, okay, whose fault really was that, okay? So let's go through the learning pyramid first and then answer your question second, okay? In the learning pyramid, audio and visual is considered 20% retention only. Yes. So if we wanted to teach you how to drive a car and we only showed you a video, you would only retain 20% of it. And we might be worried about who we encounter as other individuals in a car, right? Sure. Yeah. The second step in that retention pyramid is discussion. And once you see the concept, you get a grasp of what it might be. And now you add discussion element to it. You've now, it's stacking retention. Now you've increased the retention to 50%. So at least now in driving the car, we've seen what you're supposed to do. We might have learned the rules and we've talked about it. Okay. Mm. The last major component of learning anything. <clears throat> according to National Training Laboratories, is participation. Doing it. Doing it. So let's use the example of driving a car. What if you did only the in-class work, you learned the rules, and you did, but they never put you in a car and they gave you a license and they say, go drive a car. That wouldn't go so well, would it? No, it'd, be, it'd be pretty crazy. It'd be pretty <laughs> crazy, right? When you start to drive a car and you have... Uh, you're a student driver and you have a teacher with you and the teacher's there to help you say, okay, yes, you're going to stop. Yes, you're going to go. You do this, do that. It, any, any uh, let's say, um, confusion you might have had on adapting what you were told, they help you with in that moment, right? And now, because you've done it with them, just like driving a car, you feel better equipped after you get your license to do it on your own but you still don't master it after you get your license, still for a couple of years, right? Like I know in the state of Arizona where we're at, even when you get your provisional license, you're limited to the number of people that can ride with you for a certain period of time. You can't take strangers. You can only take siblings. The law is saying, hey, we know you're new at driving the car. Let's make it as safe as we can. Cool. It's the same in teaching your children. That's why our curriculum is set up this way. So let's give you an example of a, a, a character trait that's very important called teamwork, okay? Teamwork, every employer wants a team player, right? Every household, every father wants a team environment in their household. So one of the things I would ask our martial arts students is, I would say, what team are you on as a child? Let's say you're an eight-year-old boy or eight-year-old daughter. It doesn't matter. I would say, what team are you on? And 99% would tell me 
I'm not on a team. I don't play basketball. I don't play soccer. I don't do anything like that. And I would say you are on a team. It's called your family. And you might not have thought about it and you might not have realized it, but you are on a team. So if we want our child to learn, any child, as an example, to help pick up their clothes, to help clean a room, do any activity that the parents ask them to do physically like that. So what we would do is we would tell them the concept. It's important to be a team. Here's why. Here's the benefits and that kind of thing. Secondly, we would talk about it. Our example in the classroom that we would do would be, let's say we had 20 students. We'd all have them stand in a single line. And we had these little square mitts that you would punch if you put on your hand. We would take those mitts and we'd throw them all over the floor, the training deck. It would be a mess. What I would do is all 20 kids are standing in line and I would take just the first child and say, let's act like this first child is mom at home. We're all the other 19. You're going to sit and watch while mom, the first child is emulating mom, is actually going to have to clean up. And we'd say, go. And that child would go pick up one of the mitts on the floor. There'd be 20 of them and bring it back and stack it and put one. That child that's in the front would then go get number two mitt, bring it back and stack it, and so on, number three and number four. While that one person is doing everything by themselves, I would look at the other 19 and say, do you think this is fair? Why is only one person doing all of the cleanup? And then I Good would point. look at him and say, if mom is doing, picking up all 20 of these, do you think she's going to get tired? Hmm. Do you think she's going to get tired of doing it by herself every time? And then I'd look at the other 19 and say, okay, are you tired? No. Did you contribute? No. Okay. Let's Now, after that first person brought all 20 of them, stacked them up, I said, okay, we're going to change this exercise. And you timed them too, which was interesting. And we timed them. Yeah, thank you. I forgot that. Okay. And so we took those same 20 that that first person stacked up and we redistributed them all throughout the floor again. I said, but this time we're going to do it differently. When the first person goes, they're going to go pick up one. They're going to bring it back and set it down. They're going to go to the back of the line. Now, number two student of 20 is going to go pick one up and bring it back, and so on, number three and four. When we timed it, not only was it faster, they were smiling and enjoyed the process because they contributed. Okay? That's how you teach a concept. Number one, you tell them the idea. Number two, you discuss it with them. And number three, you actually role play it and do it. Okay. And it was interesting because of the the students, um, when they, you could see them, a light bulb go off, right? Because they're like, oh, you know, and and, and that was amazing um, in that exercise in particular, because um, they saw the impact and then they saw the relationship because the discussion happened, you know, and then, then we had a, a process then, okay, next, this whole week, you're going to go home and you're going to help mom around the house. And now they understood why it was important to kind of have a chore or why it was important to contribute. And then it builds the whole unity in the family, we found. So, so right. So as an example, sometimes I would run into parents that would say, mm. um, I don't want my children to have any chores in the household. I don't want them to help or contribute. And I was always confused by that. And I said, can you help me better understand why? Right. And and I would get many different answers. I would get an answer like, well, we're the adults, we should help them. And, da, 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 da. and I said, okay, can I share an example with you of a student that this did in their family household and what the dynamic what happened in the dynamics because of that thinking? So I said, we had a, a mom and a dad, and there were the family had three children. 
the second child, the second child was developmentally disabled. Mom felt so bad for the second child. When we did this exercise, she asked the oldest one to help clean up the table. And she asked the youngest one to help keep the living room clean for one week. <clears throat> but the second child, she gave that child nothing to do in the household. Right. Because she felt that child was already struggling enough with their day-to-day -day living. And she was worried about piling any more on. She just said, you know, I think it's too much. I don't think they're capable. I don't want to ask it. I just want them to focus on the schoolwork they're doing. It's too much. Well, our curriculum that we would teach of a topic, let's say it's teamwork. And our, what we do is we teach that for four weeks. It takes time to learn, right? And I tell you a story about that. That'd be a different topic. But by the second week in our teaching the, the children in her household teamwork, her second child that was developmentally disabled started acting out and had never done that before. It was behavior she had never seen. So she put up with it for a while because she was sympathetic to the needs of the child. But finally, by the third week, she contacted my wife and said, we got to have a meeting. This is not working. <laughs> the household, the, the unity we used to have, the fun that we used to have was falling apart. I said, okay. So we had a family meeting with that household. Mom and dad and the three children all came in and we started to ask, and would you be shocked? I asked the second child very easily and, and you'd be surprised. Children will tell you anything if you just ask. Um, and I said, mom says that these are some of the behaviors she's seen you doing. Is that true? Are you doing that? And he said, yes, I am. I said, is it okay? Do you mind if I ask you why? Why are you doing those? And you know what? He looked at his mom and said, don't you love me? Yeah. And his mom was like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> well, the, she, what she missed was he no longer felt included in the family. Everybody else was contributing and he wasn't. And he felt left out. So we, then I said to him, okay, what would you like to do moving forward? He was very simple. He said, mom, what do you want me to do? Mom said it. From then on, when he did it, he felt included and the household was doing better than it even did before. Okay. So sometimes as parents, we have the best of intentions and there's a good reason behind what we do. Mom loved them and she was so worried about adding more. But the part she missed was he needed to be included in the family unit. And when everyone else was doing jobs, he wanted to do them too. And he felt left out. And if I can go back to your comment, I thought it was interesting you had shared about that um, oftentimes parents expect, think that their children are more capable and have higher expectations. Do you remember saying something? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I thought that was interesting because we have experienced actually quite the opposite. opposite. Yes. Being that the parents like it, uh, don't want to challenge, their, they don't, they, they think the student, their children have less capable skill sets than they do. And what we have to challenge our the parents on often is to say, yes, a three-year-old can help you clean a room. And they're like, no. And we're like, yes, they can put it, pick a pillow up and put it on the on the couch. They can start to contribute. And if we never ask them, they're never going to be challenged to learn more. I mean, it would be horrible if we sent our children to school and, you know, expected them to know what's already coming. They don't. So we have to be the ones who set the bar just a little bit higher each time. And um, we have several stories uh, where, you know, like a, the one person who had participated in our program, she's like, I don't think my daughter is going to understand this. And we're like, 
yes, she'll get it. Just try it, you know. It's time. Yeah. And and you, um, our job, I believe, as as especially as a father, is to challenge our children in learning. We, I'll give you an example. When my oldest was in kindergarten and he was going to go to first grade, I didn't know he was my first child. I didn't know what a parent's supposed to do to get him ready for school. I, so I took it upon myself to teach him how to add and subtract before first grade. He and I worked on that every day until I knew he got it. And, and to my surprise, the teacher, the math teacher in first grade, called me after the first week and said, he already knows how to add and subtract. What do you want me to do with him for this year? And I was floored. I thought, wait a minute. I was trying so hard with him just because I wanted to get him ready. I, I, it was just care and love and passion that I was, I, I didn't think anything bad of it. You know, how can it be bad that I'm helping him learn things that he needs to learn? And nothing, nothing against the teacher. Obviously, it ended up to be, it was a small school and um, she just now had someone who knew all of this stuff in the classroom. And so he was bored, right? Um, and so that made it hard for her to teach, you know, the rest of the class. But And what do I do was, with yeah. him, you yeah. know? And so um, I had the best of intentions. I wanted to do the best for him. And I, he's an individual that anything you teach him, he can learn. And I was so excited by that. I just kept teaching him more and more because I wanted, as a father, as that legacy, I believe it's my job to educate and teach to get them ready, not only for the world, but to have a family of their own as well. Right. And so I felt if I took time with him when he was younger, when he became an adult and he had his own children, that maybe he would do the same. And. And I think that also speaks to the idea of, um, you know, when he was young, like all of our children, like all children, um, they're like sponges, they right? They're, they want to learn yeah. and learn and learn. And uh, if we miss that opportunity, we knew that's a missed opportunity. Um, and so I think it's important for parents to, to know that because we understood it, but it was from my background and working with kids. Um, in, in, in knowing that, but yeah, there's a limited window to where they're excited about learning. Right. I don't know if you have older kids, but mm -hmm. the, that, that kind of wanes as they get older. Um, and, and many kids, but that, that spongibility, we call it for these kids is just, just keep giving them, just fe keep feeding them everything you want them to learn. You know, and what are these, what are these, um, opportunities? Hold on, Matt. What, what are these opportunities that you're seeing? Uh, as a feel-good father, like what should the feel-good father be looking for? Well, the, the feel-good father should be looking for teaching opportunities. How does, how, pretend like he doesn't have a good, he didn't have a good father role model. Pretend like he's right. coming into the situation where he doesn't know what to look for. Right. What behavior should he be seeing? What does he want to see? From my uh, from my perspective, and maybe Matt has a different thought, would be anything that you think could help them take the steps to being more successful in life. So when they're you know sitting at the table, um, you know are they are they holding their fork correctly in a way that's you know just when you're out in a restaurant you don't you know hold the fork like this and you know but you hold it properly and and so it's opportunities that when you you need to be if they're looking for it, they will see it, I guess. I'm hoping. Um, and then they can just say, okay, we're going to take this down a step. And then we're going to teach them fundamentals to move forward. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah. So I, the table manners was great, you know, and that was, um, uh, yes, you know, correcting how to hold a fork, how to, how to appropriately cut up your food, that kind of jazz is, is fantastic. You know, I, I was thinking more of the the teamwork, like we had a good discussion there, discipline, focus, yes. okay. leadership, so, those kind of things. Like we're, we're looking at an example here. Exactly. So, you know, 
would you permit me to draw another parallel to help explain Absolutely. this point? Okay. So if you're a manager in a company and you're going to hire a receptionist, first thing you do in that hire is you might create those duties and responsibilities. So before you hire that person, you can say to them, we need you to do this, 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 and this. Can you do that? Right? So they know clearly what you want from them, what you expect, right? Secondly, most companies have what's called a training program, right? Where they don't just hire you as a receptionist. And then the next day they put you on the phone and you're all by yourself and you don't know what to do, right? A training program in a company generally pairs that individual that's new with a seasoned person and they get to watch what that seasoned person does, how they do it, ask questions so that they can emulate what that seasoned person is doing so they can be successful at that same role. Only after they're trained, do you then say, okay, we think you're ready to do it on your own. And then even after that, you still would do review, periodic reviews of their performance. You might listen to a phone call. You might go through it with them and say, next time when this happens, maybe you could do it this way, right? That's what we do with an employee for a new job that they've not done before. What I see with parents so much is they don't describe and explain to the child what they want done. They don't set an expectation of how to do it. They just jump into, you didn't do it right, not, but I'm upset. So let's give an example. Um, we, we had the one example of teamwork. All right. So let's use an example of cleaning your room. Dad may say to the child, before we go to the park, you need to clean your room or whatever it might be, okay? So many times when there's a conflict that arises, the room doesn't get cleaned or it's not to their satisfaction or there's, you know, you didn't do it right, so we're staying home. Those problems would trickle down to us. And so then we would have a family meeting with the family and say, okay, let's figure out what's going on, why, why this didn't happen. And when we got to the root of the problem, most of the time, it wasn't that the child didn't want to do it. Most of the time, they didn't know how to meet the parent's expectation. Because the parent really never said, this is what I want you to do when I say I want you to clean your room. They didn't do it with them. They didn't show them, just like you would do with an employee. If you hired a receptionist, you would say, these are the things we're going to do. Let's do it together first. Then you're ready to try it on your own. Then we review you. They don't do that. They think th they haven't thought enough about it to say, I want you to do this and work with them and show them and do it. Set that proper expectation that you have for your child. You know, one of the, um, uh, I, I can't remember his name, but he's a, a very well-known Navy SEAL that wrote a book called, with the title, Make Your Bet. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book or not. Uh, Admiral he, McCarran, I think is his name. There you go. Admiral yeah. McCarran. Exactly. Book. Have you listened to his? Okay. We, one of our activities is we had our children make their bed. You would not believe how many parents told us that was a bad thing. Children should not need to make their bed. It's not an important skill to learn. Why are you having them do that? They don't want to do it. It's not teaching them anything, right? Until that book came out. And that admiral did a YouTube, you can watch on YouTube, the power of his commencement speech when he talks about it. Everybody after that said, okay, we get now make why, why it's important to make your bed. Okay. So it's what, so sometimes as parents, he made it important to understand that it's important to get one, accomplish one goal every day. And the first thing to do by making your bed is a good way to start your morning off. You had some success in the day, correct? Now, that's an adult thought. That, that it, it, a child is not able to process that thinking, even if you tell them that, and they're eight years old. It's not going to sink in. But we as parents know 
the value by reading that book, how important it is ultimately at the end of in their life as they become an adult themselves, that they're it's valuable and they'll incorporate it potentially. I st- we still have parents that wouldn't do it, even though we recommended it. And we told them the value that it would bring their child later in life. And that it's important to create those positive habits. And they still wouldn't do it. Um, and even though we showed them the book, we had books we would lend out to them that they could read as a lending library to show them the value. And some still wouldn't and refuse and, to do it. But, yeah. And on that note, I, um, I want to say we get that it's easier to do it yourself or not it have is. it done as a parent. I'm sure you know that. Um, and it takes a little more time. Um, and sometimes you don't feel you have the time, but it's so, so important to raising our children up um, to help them be capable, right? It, it, I think that the the core, if I was going to describe what fathers typically, the typical father would think, not necessarily feel good father, but the behavior that I've seen is that most of the time we have an unconscious competence. We've developed these things. We don't understand the importance of developing a skill. As you said, it's, it's, if you've never had a leader teaching you how to lead, there's no capability of you to transfer that skill on. And so that skill transfer, going from an unconscious competence to consciously competent, which is how we transfer a skill in the first place, we expect our kids to understand what the expectations are. We expect them to figure it out. We expect independence. Because at this point in their life, they're in their mid-30s or in their mid-40s, they're expected to have some sort of competency. They're expected to have independence. And so we just forget that as with any sport, you know, I've done martial arts, I played team sports all growing up, the whole thing. It takes a level uh, and a measure of learning how to walk before you learn how to run. And in these world, we're hanging out with people that have just learned how to crawl. And so they haven't learned how to walk yet, right? They just, they're, they're pre-SOP level, standard operating procedures. They're pre-SOP mm-hmm. le- level in their development. Mm-hmm. And we need to Correct. simply bring it down to their level to understanding. Uh, absolutely love that. Um, we had, we could keep going for a long time. What would be the one thing that you would, you would suggest that a feel-good father would do to incorporate some of the lessons that we've talked about today? Sure. So <clears throat> I guess one of the things that we're looking at starting is a father's group that want to work collectively weekly to develop their children. Okay. So if you have anybody that's interested in maybe joining a group like that, where we can support each other, that's one thought just as a thing. But to answer your question more appropriately, I would encourage the father to identify what is important to the family's future development. So if it's discipline, okay, this month, let's work on discipline. Have the father create some things to watch, have the father discuss it with the kids, and have the father do it with the children. And remember, you know, uh, arguably, Stephen Covey would say for an adult to create a new habit, it takes 32 times or 38, depending on what expert you listen to. Dr. Ruth Peters arguably says for a child to create a new habit, it takes 100 times, right? So to answer your question, I would encourage the fathers to identify the skills and traits that they believe their children need to develop and put a plan together to impart that knowledge in a way that resonates with them. And keep in mind those three retention patterns to help the children learn it. So that's what I would encourage them to do. Um, Audra and I, between uh, Christmas and New Year, we make up our calendar for the next year of what we're going to do. We say, okay, in January, we're going to work on focus. In February, we're going to work on respect. And we do that for every month. And then we go back and we say, okay, for that first month, we have four weeks. What activities can we do in week one? What can we do in week two? What can we do in week three? What can we do in week four that will drive home the learning of that important skill that they'll benefit from? So it's planning that 
that makes those things happen. And, and all children are different and all households are different and families are different, right? And so the whole reason we've put our program together is that for the fathers that don't have time to do that, we have a duplicatable program that's all done for you. You just put the pieces in. You, the kids watch the video. We give you the three questions to talk about as the discussion points, and we give you the thing to work on for the week. We've taken, we know how busy fathers are. We know that they want to create a legacy. Most of the time, they just don't know what to do or have time to create their own. And, and so that's the role we've tried to fill is create that for them so it's very simple and effective, okay? So, but that's what we would recommend a father to do is if you want to teach your children how to tithe, how do you do that? First, you do it yourself, right? Then you show them how. Audra did a phenomenal job of creating three envelopes. And when they would bring money home, she helped them go through it. That was a phenomenal teaching experience. But if no one ever did that with you, you should save this amount because you're going to need it, you know, in retirement. You should live on this amount. You, those important skills, if they're not taught and you don't show them when they get their first check and they, you don't do it with them, they, they don't develop good habits. Yeah. Most kids are impulsive, right? Yeah. <laughs> and most adults are as well, right? Um, you know? But it's those habits that you Structure. learn. So, so to answer your question, I would tell a father, identify the skills and character development things that you want them to learn. Work with your spouse to create a program on a monthly basis of what we're going to work on in the household to help these children learn these skills. And, and so that would be my advice that way. Absolutely love it. And have fun. Uh, thanks. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Andre. What was that? And I said, and have fun doing it. You know, don't, it's, yes. it's your, it's special time with your, your son or your daughter. So. Yeah. And, you know, to a good point to that, I, I was brought up in a very, let's say militant household. And I was taught, you know, you're not allowed to smile. You're not allowed to have fun. You're not allowed to, you know, and, you know, I, what really taught me is I had a six year old boy that walked up to me at the end of class. And he says, Mr. Karam, don't you like me? And I mm -hmm. said, well, Jacob, why would you say that? And he said to me, you never smile at me. And, you know, I'm worried about how many students I have in the room. Are they doing their skills correctly? What are parents doing in the waiting room? Is, is anyone going to do something that's going to get them hurt? And he came to me to the most rudimentary piece. You didn't smile. And I said, Jacob, thank you. You taught me a very valuable lesson today. And I will work really hard from now on to smile because I know how important that is to you. Right? So to, to Audra's point, I think sometimes it's so easy for a, another spouse to see those things in you that you don't see in yourself. And she would point those out to me. And, and I, number one, had to be willing to accept it. And number two, had to be willing to change. And I was. Uh, because it's a, the the best for our children, and that's all that mattered to me. So, so yes, I think that's an important piece. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Matt and Audra. Everybody. <laughs>